Welcome, everybody. Um, so I'm uh, Jason Grebley. I'm a professor at the Kirby Institute uh, at UNSW Sydney. And uh, before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm presenting from today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that might be on the call or on the information session. Um, look, we, we just wanted to have a bit of an, uh, an opportunity to share with people uh, what's going on with the National Australian Hepatitis C Point of Care Testing Program and the expression of interest process, and just to answer any questions people might have. We also have uh, Carrie Fowley from Hepatitis Australia, um, and she's going to be joining us as well, and is joining us, is here, <laughs> and is going to just say a few words on, on some exciting uh, work that, that Hepatitis Australia is leading, and, and really, um, work we've been jointly talking through in terms of how to really mobilize um, all of the stakeholders working in the space uh, around hepatitis C, um, testing and treatment uh, to sort of move forward and, and really invigorate things moving towards elimination over the next uh, several years. Uh, so yeah, very excited to chat about ways that we can kind of consolidate our efforts and, and work in harmony to sort of achieve all the end goals. Um, so without any further ado, I'll, I'll begin with the uh, presentation. Before we begin, I would just like to really acknowledge all of the stakeholders that have been involved in this project. It's been just a monumental sort of effort, um, and, I, and I just really appreciate all the contributions we've had. So pretty much all of the state health departments, um, all of the uh, hepatitis community organizations and all the organizations representing people who use drugs. Um, sort of uh, across the country involved in and a range of different health services. So I just, um, and also clearly the Australian Government Department of Health who have provided the funding for this initiative and, and really have placed us in, in terms of an opportunity of being internationally leading um, in, in some of this work. I'd also just like to um, specifically thank the um, National Australian Hepatitis C Point of Care Testing Im Program Implementation Team um, and so there's, I won't mention everybody, but, um, and also sort of the key program partners um, across a range of different areas. So just thanks so much to everybody. All right, so this is what we're gonna try and run through today. Um, try and get it done in about sort of 20 minutes. Um, first, focusing on why we need a national hepatitis C point of care testing program. What opportunities exist for scale up of point of care testing? Uh, touch a little bit on what's been done around STIs and COVID point of care testing and some work that's been led by um, the Kirby and the Flinders um, International Center on Point of Care Testing. And then uh, give you a little bit about a background about what the plan is for the program, some of the research that's embedded into this, and, and then the expressions of interest process, a little bit on future directions. We'll take some question and answers. Uh, well, we'll take some questions and I'll provide answers for ones people that have submitted them in advance of the, 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 the presentation. And then uh, Carrie's gonna present. Uh, on some of the work that Hepatitis Australia has been doing and, and working to mobilize people around enhancing access to care nationally. And then lastly, we'll end with some opportunity for people to put questions in the chat and I'll answer them. So you can do that, please feel free. Um, you know, we have an hour, so I'm really happy to answer any questions that were pre-submitted. All right, so why, you know, why are we here? Why are we talking? Um, you know, I think both the global health sector strategy from the WHO and the national hepatitis C strategy have um, placed elimination of viral hepatitis um, and, and with a goal to eliminate hep viral hepatitis as a major public health threat by 2030. Um, and what we've sort of seen is, uh, you know, in, in the top is looking at hepatitis C RNA testing and the bottom is looking at hepatitis C treatment. Um, and what we're seeing across the board is a decrease in testing observed in Australia and also a decrease in the number of people initiating treatment. So we need to do something about that. And this is some modeling work from the Burnett Institute from Nick Scott. And essentially what it is, what it says is that, you know, if we take sort of status quo, which is in the blue, and really if we look at the purple line that in order to achieve elimination by 2030, it, it tells us that we'll need to um, in, well, to, to keep treatment numbers maintained, but we also need to increase our RNA testing um, because we're going to run out of people um, in terms of those that are diagnosed um, in order to be able to treat them. So we need to increase testing if we're going to achieve elimination as a viral, as a public health threat. So look, 
I think many of you may have seen a similar slide to this, but uh, it's not surprising that we've got this drop off in the care cascade. You know, sometimes it takes up to five visits um, in order to receive a diagnosis. And you've got various points along the cascade where people are potentially lost to follow up. And so it, it you know, we need to think about ways of how to simplify things. Um, I do think that uh, finger stick point of care testing for RNA detection is a, a major breakthrough. So this is gene expert platform. Uh, you can take a finger stick of blood into the minivat. And this is what the platform looks like. It's a machine that sort of sits on top of, uh, can sit on top of a desk or a table and a result is available in 60 minutes. And I, I really think that the, now the Therapeutics Goods Administration has approved um, the HCV viral load finger stick assay for detection of HCV infection, and this can be done in an hour. And I really, at the point of care, so it's really a game changer. If we think about the DA therapies as being the first game changer, I really think that the availability of this technology is a second game changer in terms of addressing the care cascade. And why that is, is because it enables testing, diagnosis, and treatment all to happen in a single visit. And so that allowed, it, you know, and also a lot of you know, many, many people who've been infected um, are people who inject drugs who have poor venous access. And so they would, and and we, we know that from data that, that there, is increased test acceptability of, of a finger stick test as compared to venipuncture in this population. So with all of that combined, it would it potentially reduces loss to follow up. So it really provides an opportunity to address this drop off in the care cascade. I think the other thing to note is that the assay also has very good technical accuracy. It's a it's a lab in a box, so it's a, a PCR based machine, and so um, it, and it has very good sensitivity and specificity. So I just wanted to run through some data really quickly from a couple of studies just to show you, you know, what's so sort of the potential behind this. So this is the Tempo pilot study, and this was done in collaboration with Kirkton Road Centre and, and New South Wales Users and AIDS Association, and just like to acknowledge them for all their work in this study. So participants were recruited from the NUA um, community-led NSP in Sydney. Uh, 101 people were recruited between September 2019 and April 2021. And the model of care that was implemented was essentially uh, people uh, attending the service um, to pick up injecting equipment were offered uh, by a peer engaged in, in sort of the, the waiting area uh, by a peer and offered point of care RNA testing. Those that were positive um, had a nurse assessment and were then linked together with that peer support worker to be able to support them through treatment. Fiber scan based disease assessment and um, was provided and also point of care testing for HIV using the Allure HIV combo assay and for Hep B using the Allure determined to Hep B surface antigen assay in those that had um, detectable antibodies. A fairly marginalized population, 100% injected in the previous month. 18% had greater than daily injecting. Um, so this just shows the results of the 101 people that were tested, 27% were RNA positive, 71% um, of those initiated treatment as part of the study, and then 7% actually weren't eligible to initiate treatment as part of the study, but initiated treatment outside uh, the study. And so overall, 78% initiated treatment. So pretty impressive uh, considering this population. The other thing that was really interesting is we weren't sure how many people would actually want to start in the same visit and um, overall 53% initiated treatment in the same visit and actually everybody initiated treatment within three visits uh, within three days um, of, of receiving that result. So pretty, pretty impressive um, engagement. The other study I just want to talk about is, is the pivot study. So it's a study that's being led by Andrew Lloyd and I. And participants were, and I should also acknowledge uh, Yumi Shin, who's um, done an amazing job with this, uh, coordinating this project and leading this project. And, and so thanks to her for pulling this together. Uh, so participants were recruited from a reception prison um, on the mid north coast of, of New South Wales, up at Kempsey. And so we had a control period between October 2019 and May 2020, um, and enrolled 240 people. And then an intervention phase, which lasted from June 2020 to April 2021. Um, so 301 people were enrolled. So participants had a point of care RNA test, a survey, a clinical assessment and a fiber scan, <clears throat> and then were fast tracked for um, DA therapy. And, um, and then this was sort of uh, also fast tracked in terms of their treatment initiation. So if we look at the standard of care, <clears throat> so overall 240 enrolled, 48% had ever injected. Um, so we're at risk of Hep C. 18% um, of those had received HCV antibody or RNA testing. And of those that were 
that had received testing, there were 44%, so 19 that were positive. And so 26% of those that were RNA positive initiated treatment in that standard of care phase, and that took about 90 days. Then the one-stop shop sort of intervention was implemented. So of the 301 enrolled, just 42% uh, had ever injected. Um, amazing. So not surprisingly, we we're offering everyone point of care testing. So 99% um, had point of care testing. And you can see that um, that was an increase from 18% to 99%, um, which is um, a great increase. Of those that tested positive, there were 30 individuals that tested positive, so 10%. And again, pretty impressive, 93% uh, initiated treatment as compared to 26%. So clearly a really important strategy in prisons. Um, so we can, we can also, in terms of not just use it for initial testing and diagnosis, but we can use point of care testing for SVR confirmation, and then also for post-treatment monitoring of HCV reinfection. And that'll all be allowed within the program. I just wanted to touch in terms of thinking through our strategies to improve testing. And so I've talked about this scenario. So, you know, this single visit model where you would do point of care, you know, direct point of care RNA testing. And that might be suitable in high prevalence settings like drug treatment clinics or needle and syringe programs. But well, what should we do in lower prevalence settings? And well, the approach that we've kind of been considering and really have been sort of inspired by the group in South Australia, um, so the folks running the prompt study, uh, to look at a strategy that might think about using a rapid point of care antibody test and then in individuals who are positive reflex point of care RNA test them and this might be a more cost effective approach compared to point of care RNA testing everybody. So look there's a lot I think you know really fortunate that that Rebecca Guy and and Mark Shepard so Rebecca Guy from the Kirby Institute and Louise Causer and uh, Belinda Hengel and Kirsty Smith and also from Flinders, Mark Shepard, Sue Matthews and, um, and, and the team there have uh, set up a really strong program for both STI testing and COVID point of care testing using the Gene Expert. So there's just over, I think, 100 services now nationally with the Gene Expert machine. These are primarily um, remote and rural um, Aboriginal community controlled health organization and this shows on the right hand side a map <clears throat> of where those services are located. But I just wanted to draw your attention that it's, you know, there's a lot of bits and pieces that go into ensuring that the point of care testing is done right. So, you know, site selection criteria, ensuring that tests are, you know, pick sites that are going to be able to use it properly or that, that have a use for such testing. We don't want machines sitting there, you know, not, not testing and putting them in places where they might not be used. The governance and community engagement is super important. We need policy and guidelines in place. Um, risk and quality management, you know, these are little mini labs, so we really need to have the quality assurance framework in place to be able to make sure that the tests are, you know, the machines are working properly. Uh, training and protocols and getting operators trained up and using the machine. If you're not, you know, comfortable with how to use it, then you're not going to want to use it and you're not going to use it well. Um, we need to think through stuff like connectivity and reporting systems and making sure that the results go back into the medical records and making sure that the results get to the public health units and, and so on. And then there's issues around procurement, ensuring that, you know, you get the cartridges when you need them ordered, you get the mini vets, you get all the other pieces. So uh, just lots of stuff going in. And then at the center is really the patient and the community and ensuring that they are getting the testing that they need. So just a little bit about the national program. So the plans to set up between 65 and 80 sites nationally with 50 to 60,000 people tested. Um, and the plan is uh, to test these between July 2021 and July 2023. Um, the Commonwealth Department of Health has invested six and a half million dollars uh, and funded the Kirby Institute and the International Center for Point of Care Testing at Flinders University to, um, to, to sort of in, in embark on this program. And I just also, I don't think I said it enough, but really like to thank the team at Flinders, um, so Sue Matthews and, and Corey Marcus, who've just been absolutely amazing in collaborating and getting this program up and running. Um, so anyway, so the, the plan, and also to Andrew Sargent in New South Wales Pathology, who we've been working with in New South Wales. So the plans to get up, so the first 25 sites is a range of different studies so that have been using point of care testing so far. So that's sort of some of the first cabs off the rank. And then the plan is for an additional 40 to 60 sites uh, to get up and running, uh, 40 to 55 sites. Um, and there's 40 sites that are being, where gene expert machines will be purchased through this program. Um, and then probably about 15 of these sites will be in prison. 
So the program includes standard operating procedures, logistics, deployment, setup, training, and a quality assurance program. Um, in terms of the criteria, so this is the site selection process. So the, the criteria is so health care, so health service providing care to people with risk factors for HCV, so pretty broad. We want to ensure that the service is providing testing with populations where the antibody prevalence is greater than 10%. Look, there'll be some exceptions. We really want to ensure that there's re remote rural coverage. Um, we want to ensure that in places like Aboriginal community control health organizations, there's opportunity for machines to be placed. So that's why we're looking at this two stage sort of antibody, two step versus one step um, sort of approach. And in those lower prevalence populations, we'll, we'll probably use a, a two step approach. We want to make sure that the machines are being placed in, pla in places where there's high enough testing. So we're trying to endeavor to, to test more than 250 clients annually. Um, <clears throat> and we want to put it in places where there's established models of care or the potential to establish a novel model of care. So um, both of those are important. We want people to have a demonstrated need for point of care testing. So transient population, high level loss to follow up, high burden, regional settings, opportunities for mobile outreach. We want to really encourage people to collaborate with other partner organizations. So whether that's partnering up and sharing a machine or working together to do outreach with in partnership with people. At the end of the day, we want to have a you know machine in every PHN and we want people to be working together. We just want to work to amplify all of the existing amazing efforts that are ongoing. We want to, uh, the sites need to have a clearly articulated plan for how they're going to implement it and then have systems in place or be willing to establish systems to support point of care testing. Look, at the end of the day, there's scarcity. We do have quite a number, large number of machines, but we'll have to make decisions about sites. So, you know, um, you know, that's going to be all taken into consideration, but we want to make sure that there's good geographic distribution. So the proposed plan will be that the first 50% uh, of sites will be through sort of an, a more objective uh, ranking uh, based on peer review of these, based on these criteria. So we're going to be getting peer reviewers to review the expressions of interest. It's going to be a process that's independent of Kirby and Flinders, and a group will decide those based on merit. So 50% of the remaining sites will be selected through that process, and we'll be selecting sites so that there's an equal distribution across the states and territories based on the burden of Hep C in each jurisdiction. Um, and then the next 50% will look at um, where the gaps are and in collaboration with the state health departments and other stakeholders will decide on where the best placement is of the remaining machines just to provide some flexibility to make sure that they don't all go to the cities or they don't all go to a particular you know, place within region within the, the state or territory. So the program is going to provide standard operating procedures <clears throat> for point of care testing implementation, all the mini vets, so that's the blood collection devices, uh, the test cartridges. Um, I wanted to note that we will be providing HCV antibody tests through research related funding, but because the HCV antibody tests are not TGA approved, we actually do need to consent participants to be able to you know, use that as a, a testing methodology. So we'll need to you know, ensure that people are consented through that process and, and the Commonwealth Department of Health funding can't be used for those antibody tests. So we do have some research related funding that we're going to be funding those tests through. So um, yeah, we can have a chat about what the situation is at your site. We're also going to have all this hard software and hardware for the IT connectivity. I just want to emphasize that that's not a deliverable for the funding from the Department of Health, but it's something that we're really keen to ensure happens. We'll also be offering participation in a quality assurance program and training program, which I'll discuss about in a second. And the GeneXpert laptops and devices will be set up with the required software deployed to the services and the sites will be provided with remote support to assist with the setup. So just in terms of a little bit more about the quality, the training and quality assurance program. So in collaboration with Flinders University, um, New South Wales Pathology, St. Vincent SIDPATH and the National Reference Lab, we've developed a, a program and we, in collaboration with Cepheid as well. And essentially, um, there'll be, depending on where you are, it'll be slightly different. Um, in New South Wales, we're working together with New South Wales Pathology. Um, and also some of the sites involved in the Tempo study will, will be managed under with Flinders through the International uh, Center for Point of Care Testing. Anyways, irrespective staff for operators will go standardized, go to undergo standardized training um, provided remotely in most cases. And it'll you know go through all these things here. The plan will be is that uh, the sites will need to participate in a quality assurance program to ensure that we um, 
you know, fulfill the national point of care testing guidelines. So this will include an external quality assurance program. So a six monthly panel. So one testing event in March, April, and one testing event in September, October. Five samples will be sent. They'll be blinded to the operators. So one negative, one genotype, one low positive, one genotype mid viral load positive, one genotype three low viral load positive, and then a mid viral load positive genotype three sample. And then the sites will have to do a competency assessment uh, monthly. Um, and so again, this is just fitting with the national point of care testing guidelines. And these will be two samples that are known to the operator, a negative and a positive sample, um, and that's done. Look, I don't want to go through this in too much detail, but this is the, the, the system in collaboration with Clinical Universe, um, who we're working with. And this is the program that's being used for STIs and uh, for COVID point of care testing in collaboration with Kirby and, and the Flint and Flinders uh, University. Uh, but just to note that there'll be um, the op there's a middleware uh, generally, whether it uh, depends on whether you're in the with in the program with Flinders or through New South Wales Pathology, there'll be two different middleware systems. But um, this middleware allows for the ordering of the test to occur. It communicates with the gene expert software. And um, for the, the model where we're working together with Flinders, uh, there's a um, sort of health link which encrypts this file and it then allows for the um, results to go back into the patient management system. So this is what we're endeavoring to ensure that we have in place with each of the sites. And then also, um, this is for the COVID program, so it's going to be slightly different for the Hep C program. But the, the point here is just to make that this information will be working together with the public health units within each of the departments of health to ensure that those mandatory reporting of notifiable infections goes back to the health departments. So just wanted to kind of touch on the research component. So we submitted an NHMRC partnership project submitted on the 12th of August um, and had a range of uh, investigators and um, chief investigators, associate investigators and partner investigators. And this is uh, quite a large uh, contribution. So uh, a big contribution from Cepheid as well in terms of cartridges and machines, um, some in kind and some funding from Gilead um, as well. Um, and also from the, the New South Wales Health uh, for some sites and specifically in New South Wales. So again, big sort of thank you to everybody who is involved. Um, you know, I think, as I mentioned, I think point of care RNA testing is a game changing solution and uh, which is really going to help us to achieve the elimination targets in the national strategy. Um, look, point of care testing is going to be, the impact is going to be greatest in settings probably where there's high prevalence, but I think as I mentioned in lower prevalence settings using this two-step testing approach, I think we can modify our strategies to make things more cost effective as well. But there's going to be lots of implement challenge, implementation challenges that remain to translate point of care testing into clinical practice and part of this research is to sort of identify some of these challenges and, and address them to help more quickly translate um, the, the, the findings of this work into clinical practice and to impact on policy. The other thing that's really important is looking at both the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of point of care testing. And that's going to be really critical to inform broader implementation and, and models of funding to be able to embed this into clinical care. <clears throat> so the proposal is going to be we're going to you know, develop this national program which I've described. We're also going to look at the reach, the effectiveness, adoption, implementation and maintenance of, of this national point of care testing program using the REAIM framework um, as a strategy to increase treatment uptake and reduce hep C prevalence. We're going to look at the cost effectiveness, affordability and long-term epidemiological impact of scaling up point of care testing. Um, some social science research that is going to be led by um, Carla Trelaw and Alison Marshall, looking at perceptions of acceptability barriers and facilitators to scaling up point of care testing. And then hopefully we'll end up with an implementation toolkit, which will allow sites to get up and running more quickly. Um, I think just to note, the research is a really important component to the project because what we need, and we're going to set up a large observational cohort as part of the study, um, and that data is going to be critical to inform um, further submissions to MSAC and, and, and MBS. And that, this is at the last point here in this slide, but we really, you know, part of the problem is that we don't have a sustainable model for funding for point of care testing. So the data that we're going to generate for this will provide us with critical information, which will allow us to facilitate an application to MSAC uh, or a revision of current MBS item numbers to allow point of care testing to happen in the field. So it's just a really critical component. And we've got a pre-application meeting that we're gonna be setting up with MSAC to discuss what the requirements will be so that we can um, discuss with them what modeling and health economics they'll need to see to be able to inform that process. 
Um, again, it's been really enjoyable working with all the sites. So I've described the site selection process and it's been great liaising with all the jurisdictions. We have plans to work with state-based laboratories as they're interested. Um, and we are working to ensure that the notification of the results get into the state public health units. Um, I mentioned that we we're going to try really hard to sort out the IT connectivity solutions, but I just want to you know, emphasize that they're planned, but not included in the delivery. And so, um, you know, it shouldn't be an expectation, but kind of like a, a bonus um, in terms of getting that. So, and, and all of this is towards, you know, in the next two years or so, we want to pull away some of the research and be able to, that this then just kind of can get sucked into clinical practice. Um, that's the end goal here. Okay, so question and answer period. So a couple of questions that maybe you had, and again, if, if you have more questions, please put them in the chat. Um, the question, so can we apply if we don't meet all the criteria? I think, look, still put your application in, <clears throat> but just understand that those sites that are ranked highest in terms of the application criteria will be the most likely to um, be ranked highest in terms of that sort of objective process. But then at the second phase where, where there's discussions around where, where are the gaps, then that's where we might say, okay, well, this service doesn't maybe doesn't meet all the criteria, but would be really great. So I think I would encourage people to apply because it also dem shows demand as well. Um, if we don't test as many as the target number, can we join up with another service in the area and share the machine? If so, how do we make that work? 100%. I think we really, really want people to work together. We want to figure out how do we engage, you know, things like primary care, how do we partners so it's all about amplifying existing efforts we have this amazing opportunity to be able to get this sort of up and running so it's about making the best use of it and working together to amplify our efforts so um, in doing it you would just describe that in the application that you're going to be you know x service x service next service and that it's going to be you know a joint sort of um project programmer and, and it'll be these sites so it's interesting because a lot of the sites in the program aren't necessarily sites but could be like a local health district and it's a nurse that's doing outreach services to you know maybe one day it's a mental health clinic one day it's um, an nsp one day you're doing an outreach into the drug treatment one day it's homelessness so i think you know those types of partnerships will be really important um, somebody asked, what happens at the end of the study? Do we get to keep the machine? So we're funded for two years per site. So that's kind of what we're endeavoring to do. So, you know, you get the machine for two years. That's all we can commit to, can commit to because that's what our funding um, sort of entails. And the machines, so Kirby owns <clears throat> uh, or is, you know, through the collaboration with Cephi, has a certain number of machines that are on sort of long term lease. Um, and then there's 40 machines that are being, being purchased by the program. So the pro machines belong to the program. So I think the decisions for sites to keep the machine will sort of depend on what the funding is beyond the two years. So all we can commit to is for, for two years for right now from once the machine gets put into the service. How easy is it to move around? Um, the machine is very, very portable. We'll provide Pelican cases so that they can be protected. <clears throat> And so it's very easy to move from site to site. It, um, you know, there's a four cartridge machine can fit easily on a on a sort of table or desktop. Um, do we need to do confirmatory venipuncture tests for HCR and positive people? This is a TJ approved assay, so no, um, you do not have to do confirmatory venipuncture tests. <clears throat> In some jurisdictions, you might have to. So I, we've had some discussions with WA, and I think they're still quite keen to have confirmatory testing. Um, but there's been we don't. You know, it's not needed in the other jurisdictions. Um, do the people, pe the people operating the point of care testing machines, need to have any specific clinical qualifications? We are trying to really encourage task shifting. So I think we're open to um, training up um, needle syringe program workers, peer support workers. So uh, you know, we are open to to um, to training up a broad range of healthcare professionals, I guess, or healthcare providers. Um, can participants opt out of doing the surveys and consents and still have a test? So I think this is, um, you know, part of the program is, is around the research. We also at the same point don't want to disadvantage people. So we're not going to, you know, I think we'll need to keep an eye on it, but we're not going to mandate that. So I think we really you know, need to be careful and if people if don't want to participate, we're not going to impede their care. Um, by that way so but we'll need to keep an eye on that because we don't want that to be used as sort of a mechanism for getting out of having to do the research bits because if 
if you're going to be doing point of care antibody testing, we definitely need to be consenting people because it's not a point of, you know, not approved test. Same with the HIV point of care test is TGA approved, but the Hep B surface antigen test that we'll be providing is not TGA approved. So um, again, we'll need to consent people if we want to be using that. And that allows you to do that single visit, same visit test and treat. Okay, so I'm done there. I may um, pass it on to, uh, to, uh, to Carrie. Hello, everyone. Hello. Well, thank you, David, uh, and thank you, Jason. It's so wonderful to be here. Um, so today, um, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes providing you with a bit of context in terms of what this excellent uh, program is part of. So some of you may have attended the uh, event in November, actually last year, we've just had our first anniversary where the minister at the Parliament House committed to finding 50,000 people uh, with hepatitis C by the end of 2022 and requested a proposal on how that might be achieved. Um, and from that process, um, uh, there was a huge <coughs> amount of work that was done nationally in terms of thinking about how we might be able to amplify the work that's already being done, how we might be able to work better in concert together, how we might be able to do a big injection of concerted effort to enable the elimination of viral hepatitis to be our next major public health and preventative health success story. And um, so lots of work was done and then five pillars were then identified with, which were supported by the Minister and the Commonwealth Department of Health has been working with stakeholders since then to look at how these five pillars might be able to work together. Next slide please. So the five pillars of the Finding 50,000 initiative uh, include a national hepatitis uh, campaign, an enhancement of the national hepatitis info line, enhancement work in relation to primary care, including uh, case finding, uh, point of care uh, testing program, as you've just heard about, and also to support all of this coordination work and a national time limited working group of the Bloodborne Virus and Sexually Transmissible Infection Standing Committee, which is a national committee to look at systemic and structural issues. So we've got this really, really special moment in front of us as an Australian community to really be able to ramp up effort to one, catch up uh, on, um, I guess, some impacts of things like COVID, but also on things slowing down. And it's hoped that all of these activities, in addition to the usual business activities happening in community, would be able to work together, share information, amplify each other's activities, and really get the bang for the buck that we are looking for to achieve our targets. And I guess a big part of this as well is to think about equity and how might we ensure that uh, every person living uh, with hepatitis C across Australia has an opportunity to engage in the elimination endeavour. And so I guess a critical part in terms of speaking with the, the minister and the, about this proposal is thinking about geographic equity as well, which I know the point of care testing program has a particular lens on. Um, and I guess really just that uh, we at Hepatitis Australia are really keen to support people in whatever ways we can and say congratulations also for this uh, really impressive uh, collaborative activity that's underway. So thank you for inviting me today. Thanks so much, Carrie. That's so incredibly appreciated. So questions are open for either Carrie or I. So look, first of all, it's just amazing how many people we've got on the call. So that's fantastic. Uh, clearly, people have voted with their feet and are are interested. Um, you know, please put questions in the chat for either Carrie or I. Um, Simon, we could probably close down the PowerPoint and just have maybe Carrie and I on. So I'll start answering questions and I'll direct ones that might be to carry through the thing. We'll see what, what people want to be asking. Since yours was late, we'll give people some time. So um, how mobile is the unit? Uh, could we potentially take it on outreach when NSP staff go to homelessness slash free eat services? Like I said, absolutely 100%. That is exactly the kinds of things that we want to be doing. You know, if you look at folks like the Combi Clinic and Quinn, um, and MICA projects. They've been doing this for the past 
you know, and, and also they've had a machine at the MSER at the medically supervised injecting room in, in um, down in uh, Melbourne and also some of the South Australia sites through the prompt study. So very, so the unit's very mobile um, and outreach is where it's best. Um, it's not going to, you know, we don't want it sitting inside a clinic where you could be doing standard testing and it's not going to address that. Um, Okay, approximately how long does the patient survey take to complete and what then via what mode is this? So the survey, we've tried to keep it incredibly short. It's about 10 questions, so it should be under five minutes to complete. Essentially, very standard information, gender, um, age, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, status, homelessness, uh, in recent injecting, drug treatment, and then previous testing. Hep C testing and treatment. So it's really quite uh, brief. And then there's some basic um, information collected in the case report form, you know, the result of the HIV and Hep B test. All of the Hep C related stuff goes through the gene expert and gets transmitted electronically. So you do need to like order a test just like you do for pathology results. So that needs to be entered into the system and then that orders the test and then that gets sent off. And that's all electronic. Um, and then, you know, I think the other key bit is information around. Um, the person who's only in those people who initiate treatment. You know, what treatment did they go on? You know, what was the anticipated duration, start and stop date, whatnot. Um, all right, so I'm going to just deal with these as I answer them. Um, so uh, are there any concerns that parallel? Oh, maybe I shouldn't be deleting those. Um, I'll leave them there for David and Simon to make sure that they can publish those and then we can circulate the responses. Anyways, so are there any concerns that parallel bloodborne virus screening, which are offered by traditional blood screening, maybe missed or turned down? Syphilis, Hep B, and how are these how have these been addressed or managed in the current SA study? Um, look, I don't think that there's concerns that parallel sort of screening um, you know, can't be done. So I, I don't think there's any, there's nothing excluding also adding those visits or you know the, the opportunity for those tests to happen um so yeah so i don't think that's too much of an issue um do you have any data around treatment completion rates for participants who are diagnosed and provided a script in the one appointment we're actually just pulling the data together for tempo on that so it's still kind of hot off the press and same with pivot so but i think there's some studies that have been done internationally Actually, no, because there's not a lot of data around the, the single visit sort of treatment outcomes. Um, so stay tuned, I guess, is the answer to that. But I think it's an important thing that we need to evaluate moving forward. Um, does the machine need to be calibrated after each time it is moved? Um, I think we're just working through the exact sort of mechanisms for how much calibration is going to be need to be done and, um, yeah, and cleaning and whatnot. So we're just working through all of that right now. Um, how well does the testing perform? platform cope with frequent transportation moving around to be used in a range of settings. So again, quite, quite good. Um, this is, you know, this is being used uh, sort of in different countries in Spain and the UK and France um, around with with people, you know, traveling around. That's what this is meant uh, to do. So yeah, I think it's it, it performs really, really well. Um, how heavy is the machine? Oh, that's a great point. Um, I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, I'd imagine, I don't know, somewhere between maybe 10 and 15 kilograms. Um, I'd, I'd have to check, so sorry, I don't have that on hand. Um, do the operators need to be medically trained? No, um, we're trying to, again, um, offer opportunities for task shifting so they don't need to be medically trained. Um, as long as they're provided with the appropriate education and training um, um, sort of pathways. Um, what are the risks associated with the regular transmit devices? Again, we've talked about that, so we'll have a, the other thing is that we're going to be working very closely with the International Center for Point of Care um, testing at Flinders University with and have a pretty rigorous quality assurance program. So we'll be monitoring the number of errors and invalids and working together with the operators to make sure that they feel comfortable with the testing and same with uh, the program with New South Wales Pathology. What are the site selection inclusion criteria for the National HCV Point of Care testing program? I've already gone through those, so <clears throat> maybe I'll just uh, refer you back to the presentation. Um, great. OK, this one is to um, carry. So great. Um, oh, this is a comment. So from Sue Matthews. So great to the five pillars of finding the 50,000 in HCB elimination equity. 
thanks for your support, Hepatitis C, Hepatitis Australia. So it's just a comment. So thank you, Carrie. And it is great. I think it's been, you know, um, a really productive collaboration. And um, it's, yeah, it's excellent. <clears throat> I, again, I just want to emphasize that it's all about sort of trying to amplify all of the existing efforts here. I think one of the problems is, is that the program is not funded to provide nursing support. And, and operational support. So that's where we're sort of, you know, leaning on the partners and the jurisdictions to help provide that support. But we can cover off the program costs and the, and the testing. And again, we're really, really fortunate to have like an amazing partner with the International Center on Point of Care Testing um, with Sue and Corey and the team because they've just been amazing um, and they run sort of a really high quality service. And again, same thing with New South Wales Pathology. We've been working with them and that's been a really productive collaboration. Okay, uh, what is the process for Aboriginal community controlled health services to be considered for the program? Um, exactly the same as everybody else. So there's no difference um, and we'll be working together and ensuring that there's an, an equal distribution across different service types in each state and territory. Um, how can the cost of point of care testing be reduced in the future? Look, I think this two step pathway is a really important thing to be looking at and thinking about different testing strategies. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, we need as well, new diagnostic companies come into the market. I think the one thing is, is we really need to ask Abby, Abbott, sorry, you know, we've been working and discussing with the folks at Abbott around getting the um, Hep C antibody point of care test TJ approved and or submitted for TJ approval, but and also the Hep B surface antigen point of care test, and they are working on that. So that's exciting uh, to hear. Um, are the rapid antigen tests for each to be approved for use in Australia? So that dovetails into that question. Um, and yes, so we, they, they are not approved for use in Australia and we're working on that. Uh, there's one down here that just jumped around. Will local ethics approval be required and will local medical officer provider number be required? And Sue has put in perfect. So I was, I was not too far off. 11.8 kilograms for a four module device. So it was between the 10 and 15. So thank you, Sue. Um, will local, local ethics approval be required and will local medical officer provider number be required to order test? Yes and yes. Um, so we will be working with the sites to um, have a site specific assessment form and a provider number will be required in order to sort of order tests. Um, so I'm just trying to check there's nothing else at the bottom here. OK. Um, can the four people trained within the program train others within their site to use it? Um, no, um, the operators need to be trained by uh, either Flinders or New South Wales Health uh, Pathology. Oh, and Lisa also provided info on the weight of the machine. Um, we'll, okay, where else? We are looking at partnering with two services in regional Northern Victoria who are based both in primary care and tertiary. Our site is the link, but not actually participating. How much work will we be obliged to do as the linking service? Uh, maybe just reach out to me individually. I think that sounds like a very con context specific question. So just email me and I'm very happy to respond to emails from everybody. Um, do you recommend that baseline bloods, including full blood count, LFT and UEC are performed prior to writing the script? Um, I don't think it's necessary. Um, I think that, you know, again, you need to use clinical judgment. Um, I think what we you know, the, the medically supervised injecting room model uh, was slightly different from the tempo study that I showed, so they did actually include a venipuncture draw to do those results. But you know, I think if you've got your HIV, Hep B, and some measure of fibrosis, so if you've got a fiber scan, you know, I think that's sufficient for, and you know, you'll be able to determine whether or not they have decompensated disease. <clears throat> um, but again, I think you need to follow your clinical guidelines, guidance, and clinical governance mechanisms at your site, um, and whatever the you know. The, the procedures are around that. Um, just checking, um, so there's a couple that are popping out here. So does a fiber scan need to be done alongside the point of care test? I think if you want to do a same visit treatment initiation, you have two options. You can do a fiber scan and still do it. And if you can exclude decompensated disease, um, uh, then that, that's fine. The other thing, and this is what they've been doing with the medically supervised injecting room model, is, is still doing same visit initiation, but also taking, so ruling out sort of decompensated disease, um, which you should be able to do clinically, and then also taking a, a venipuncture draw on that day. So then you should get the results back in a couple of weeks and, and then have that as a sort of security around that. But again, I'd just like to, you know, I'd probably refer you to the, the, the standard 
hepatitis C guidelines around that and, and then follow your local clinical governance procedures. Um, so Brent Bell, how soon until a machine can be in place and training completed and testing ready to go, hoping to commence point of care testing in February 2022. So if you're submitting through the expression of interest process, there's no way uh, you'll get going through this program by then. Um, there's still a little bit of work as well to do in terms of getting WA ethics going. So I imagine WA uh, will probably, will, our plan is to try and finish the reviews by end of January, first week of Feb maybe of all the applications and then have the committee meet in February. So I imagine by the end of February, we'll have all of the sites selected, maybe February, March to, to push it out a bit. Um, okay, uh, what else Sinead? Why is provider number required if there's no MBS reimbursement? Um, that's just a, so the provider number's um, required because that's what is linked to the electronic um, medical record. So um, it'll be different in New South Wales because we're working with New South Wales pathology, but still the, the essentially the provider number is what then links where the um, results get sent. So it's the, it's the destination for the results are linked to the provider number. So that's why it's required. Um, confirming weight, what, are the, what is the proportion of pulse positives and false negatives? Are there many errors when processing the sample? A really, really good question. So like I said, the, in terms of quantification, so above and below the limited quantification, the test is pretty much in our hands has been 100% sensitive specific. We've done a systematic review of all of the studies sort of globally and, and again, uh, above and below the limit of quantification is 100%. There are some results that appear detectable but not quantifiable and those need to be uh, retested with a venipuncture draw because I think that these assays are actually too sensitive. So I think generally uh, a detectable but not quantifiable case is just sort of artifact um, of non-productive virus. But what we are recommending then in, in that case is to take a standard uh, venipuncture sample draw to confirm that sample. Errors is also important. I think errors are in relation to the training that is provided and the experience of the operators. In the ethos study where we've done several thousand tests, uh, the error rate is below 3%. Um, and, you know, but it depends. There's all sorts of contributing factors. You know, there's issues of humidity. You need a well ventilated room. So um, I just think our plan is to try to work together and uh, get the errors uh, below 3%. And that's where we're going to work really closely in the team with Sue Matthews and, and, and Corey Marcus are going to be running those aspects and the operational aspects of the program. So, um, and they've got lots of experience in that. Um, are the cleaning requirements different with HCV testing and a gene expert with a multitude of tests running? Um, we are looking at that. And we've been in discussions with Sethi about that because there's actually some issues around over cleaning because it can actually sort of wreck the machines. So we're working on that with Sethi in terms of what is a suitable um, sort of um, amount of cleaning required. Um, <clears throat> question from Connie, if we participate in the Tempo study at the NSP site, are we still able to apply for point of care testing on our mobile outreach service? 100%. So the, the sites in the Tempo study are actually some of the first ones. Uh, Connie, I did speak to David and he wasn't too keen, but maybe you can reach out to me and we can chat because, um, you know, uh, very, very supportive of the Tempo sites, um, getting a machine and um, and and using it then through mobile outreach, just not at the NSP where Tempo is going to be taking place. Um, is MSAC linked with point of care testing accreditation? So again, that's a really important point, and that's what we're working through in terms of this process with MSAC. And I know that the uh, Flinders group is is also looking at working with NADA around point of care testing accreditation in this setting. So I think it's a bit of a stay tuned. This field is moving very quickly and, and we'll see what happens. And I think particularly with COVID point of care testing, um, you know, it's really kind of driven momentum. Um, what will be the focus of the toolkit for implementation? I think, you know, we haven't decided it yet, but really um, hopefully it provides a bit of a how-to guide for how to get point of care testing up at your service um, and how to, you know, things that are challenges, barriers, and how do you overcome those challenges? Um, so it's not quite thought through yet, that component. It's all just kind of, very early days, but um, yeah, that's the plan. Um, can the gene expert machine be used for different types of tests, for example, hep C and COVID PCR? So I think I've mentioned that, but yes, there's a whole menu of different tests that can be done with the gene expert for a range of different infectious diseases, group B strap, group A strap, um, 
you know, most, a lot of, in, it, there's actually a triple a cartridge that's coming out for RSV flu and COVID. Um, so yeah, very exciting. Um, okay, so if sites are fully equipped outreach vans, uh, wouldn't that provide optimum flexibility? Absolutely, and we've been in discussions with sites in New South Wales, including Western New South Wales and North Coast and Mid-North Coast New South Wales, and also Murrumbidgee and Southern about options around trying to, you know, make best use of outreach vans. But yeah, those those are um, definitely really great opportunities. Okay, I'm just looking through, um, do we need to have uh, meds on site for same day start? It can take a few days to get meds to rural remote sites. Um, yeah, look, we, we can, you touch base with Rosie Gilver and the team at CareC have done a, a lot of work with this. I think um, they've had a really great relationship with the pharmacy that's close to the new NSP and have sorted through some of the logistical challenges around this. Um, but yeah, I think um, I think this is a really important point and one of the challenges we probably need to work through. Um, Judy, our nurse practitioner provider number okay. I'd have to check on that, Judy, but I'm pretty sure. Um, I have a comment here from Sue, so that's great. So errors in ballots can be reduced by ensuring the correct sample volume transfer into the cartridge. Importantly, no error bubbles in the transfer of sample. Um, and all of our training material, I think, uh, where's Sue's comment? Sorry, guys. Um, all of our training resources and sessions are focused on error and ballot reduction. So yeah, so that's great, Sue. Thanks for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, does the provider need to provide Medicare details? We will be asking for it, but it's not being used for reimbursement. We are getting, we are providing opt-out consent for data linkage, and if clients don't want to do that, they don't have to. Um, but we are, because what we want to do is link to MBS and PBS so that we can do the cost effectiveness analyses that we need to do um, to then make the case to the government and MBS and PBS. So that's, or to the MSAC around on that, so yeah. Our service will be involved in other HCV related research in the first half of 2022. Is it possible to register interest and involvement in second half? You have to apply now for your interest. We can delay your start, but you need to apply for this round. There won't be like a second round for, for this current pro project. Um, Carrie, five more minutes. Is there anything that you wanted to say? Um, I think I've answered all the questions there. I'm trying to see if there's any further ones for you, but is there anything that you wanted to comment on or from this discussion? We've got a couple more minutes left. Um, really just that I um, would reinforce the opportunity for all of the pillars to really work together and that there'll probably be a next stage of discussions across all the different pillars of work about how they can work in collaboration with each other. Um, for example, the campaign and the phone line and port of care testing sites all knowing what each other are doing and working to share information across the community and also to fill gaps of information and learning as we go. So I just anticipate there'll be further conversations about how we can all work together. Yeah, I think it's a really important point, Carrie. I think, you know, we've got such a great opportunity here. We just can't sort of squander it, I think, you know, um, and, and working together is going to be the only way. So, you know, just my message to everybody, and it's the same message that Carrie has been providing is, you know, see, this is a potential opportunity to amplify some of the existing efforts. All of the tests are paid for, the machines are paid for. As I said, we don't have money for nursing support, but hopefully by being able to have this, it de decreases the amount of time you're spending doing nursing stuff. And, you know, we've done some preliminary health economic analyses. The big benefit here is that you're going to be reducing several visits where you would be seeing a nurse down to a single visit or less. And I understand that some people are going to require more support and that bit's not going to change, but it's that work up bit. So hopefully we'll have decreased nursing hours and it'll it'll make things simpler. Um, and I really want to emphasize what Carrie said is that we really need to think about how does this program fit within the missing the finding the missing 50,000 people on the phone line and how do we think about outside the square or the box around engaging with general practitioners? How can we amplify these these mobile models? How do we link services together? How do we collaborate? 
because it's you know it's just going to be through collaboration that we're going to be able to get there so i'm hoping you know people said how long are the machines going to be around well from a hep c perspective i'm hoping that we can kind of knock this on it you know get elimination done in the next five years and that this really sort of accelerates our efforts and maybe we you know you won't need point of care testing machines as much for hep c you might need, need them for other diseases and and i think the other thing just to note is that we really need to move towards a more person-centric approach just like who has in its strategies and we need to stop thinking about different diseases we need to be thinking more about populations and settings so if you're at a remote aboriginal community controlled health organization you know what 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 types of tests do we want to be doing for our populations that have c have b covid you know it's it's think you know syphilis stis it's about thinking of a more sort of uh, person-centric approach and, and less disease siloed approaches. And I think that's the really exciting opportunity because there is a range of different diseases we can test for. And I also want to emphasize that point of care testing is not going to be the solution in every site. And, you know, we also need to work on our other testing mechanisms. Dry blood spot testing is critical. It expands reach. We can't forget about that. It's not, this isn't a replacement, it's just another tool. And the other thing, just for all the people that are on the line, you know, we really need to push harder about reflex RNA testing from standard blood work. And there are some discussions that are going to take place next year to, mo to mobilize people around those discussions. Because I just find it ridiculous that we're even doing antibody testing without a confirmatory RNA in, in you know, these days. So really, if people are excited about that, I am. So we need to figure out how we kind of address that because it's a big problem. So let's not forget about our other testing strategies. Point of care is not going to be the solution in the end all be all um and i think carrie you agree with me on, on that as well yeah and i would just add to that as well uh it's also important that we don't forget the full spectrum of responses so that we've got prevention harm reduction testing diagnosis treatment and ongoing care for people as well so this is an um a particular effort in this space but we have to not leave the other efforts behind Absolutely. And that's where the ongoing monitoring for reinfection, the peer support work that's being done by communities. You know, we can't forget those other components because they're critical. And someone read, you know, it's fine to test people and treat them, but if we don't, we need to make sure that they complete their treatment and that they get an SVR because that's the end of the goal is to get cure, not just initiate a bunch of people on treatment. So um, I agree fully. So anyways, I just like to say thanks a lot. We're reaching time, um, but really appreciate everyone's attention. And it was great to see so many people on the line. And please feel free to reach out to me, um, you know, jgrebley at kirby.unsw.edu.au. Um, and you can find me. And, and just please reach out to me or, or Simon or David and any of the team, and we'll be able to help you out with any questions. Thanks so much, everyone. And thanks, Carrie. Thanks. Bye. Bye. And a big thanks to David and Simon. <laughs>